Thank you, Betsy. Thank you, Jenny. Welcome everyone to day two of SOA's annual conference. And I'm excited to be moderating our next session, Amplifying Diverse Voices, Documenting the History of Underrepresented Communities at Two Ohio Universities. It is my honor to introduce our presenters. Victor Fleischer is the University Archivist, Head of Archival Services, and an Associate Professor of Bibliography at the University of Akron. Previously, he served as Special Collection Manager at Stan Hyatt, Hall and Gardens before becoming the University Archivist Special Collections Librarian, and then Head of Archives and Special Collections at Youngstown State University. Vic holds a BM, at, BA rather, and an MA in American History at, and an MLIS from Kent State University. He has presented and published on various topics of archival science and local history. His first book, The Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company, A Photographic History, was recently published by the University of Akron Press. Our second presenter, Matt Francis, is currently the archivist at Ohio Northern University and previously earned a BA from Bluffton University and an MA from Wright State University. In between his time at these fine Ohio institutions, he also worked as an archivist at the University of Wyoming, SUNY Potsdam, and Penn State University. In addition to gearing up for ONU's upcoming such, such 150th anniversary celebrations, he also enjoys long walks through archival stacks and working through archival backlogs. Please remember to post your questions in the chat or Q&A section, and Matt and Vic will answer your questions at the end of the presentation. And please do not forget the, to complete the conference survey. I now turn it over to our speakers. Thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate the introduction. And if everything has gone right, you should now be able to view my slides. So hopefully that is the case. Um, all right, thank you everyone for attending and providing me with this opportunity to share a little bit about a project that I have been privileged to work on over the past couple of years. Uh, before diving into the presentation itself, though, uh, since this topic is related to diversity and amplifying voices, I feel that it's important to mention that today I am presenting to you from ONU's campus in Ada, Ohio, which sits on land that was part of the traditional territory of the Shawnee people until they were forcefully relocated due to Amer American expansion into Northwest Ohio. All right, in understanding, thank you for allowing me to do that, and in understanding the importance of amplifying diverse voices at ONU, I believe it is important to understand uh, a little bit about our university. Founded in 1871, we are a small, private, Methodist-affiliated university located in rural Northwest Ohio. From its founding to the present day, ONU has been a predominantly white institution and currently of students who choose to identify their race and ethnicity upon enrollment, 85% identify as white non-Hispanic. When I first arrived at ONU in 2018, a quick collection survey surfaced the reality that our collections mirrored the PWI history of our institution. And consequently, we're probably even more homogenous than the current campus community itself. Because of this, one of my early priorities was to begin working to amplify some of the diverse voices that we could find in the archives, while also attempting to begin building relationships with diverse members of our campus community. With that in mind, the initial form of what became known as the ONU Black Voices Project was a simple social media outreach effort during Black History Month in 2019 during which I wanted to highlight a selection of historic Black student, staff, and faculty voices from our holdings. At this point, I want to be clear with the language that I'm using, as from the beginning, the decision was made to intentionally focus specifically on the voices of these individuals and groups, and not take an approach that would have focused more broadly on race and racism at ONU. This approach helped focus the initial scope of our work, while also providing a platform for these voices to be heard once again in their own words. However, it is also worth mentioning that one drawback with this approach was that it meant some important parts of ONU's history would not be highlighted in, our, in these particular efforts. 
including specifically in this case, the debate and student unrest surrounding ONU's initial racial integration in the early 1900s, as all of the documented voices in the archives from this era happen to be those of white voices. With that, we began to send out social media posts from our library's various accounts that shared archival records that documented black voices by sharing quotes and associated records and images. For reference, I have included in this slide a copy of the first image that we sent out, which contained a quote from a letter written by Richard Carter to our student newspaper in 1955. Carter, an ONU student and military veteran, wrote to the paper in response to a racist joke that had appeared in the previous issue. And at one point, pointedly asked the editors, is that humor, <clears throat> excuse me, is that humor to get a laugh at another sake? Or is it to help the process of stereotyping the few colored individuals present on our campus? Throughout the month, we continue to share similar posts um, and some local feedback inspired us to think perhaps we could pivot this work to also create a more permanent resource for our community members. In discussing this potential change with my library colleagues, they quickly recommended using LibGuides as the platform that made the most sense for our institution for what was now being called the ONU Black Voices Project. Then as the resource guide started coming together, I reached out to, or directly to our Office of Multicultural Diversity so that they could preview the site we were developing and provide any feedback if desired. Thankfully, the initial response back from our Office of Multicultural Diversity was positive and encouraging. And so we continued our work on the research guide. From an administrative perspective, we wanted to make sure to give some context to our work as well as avenues for feedback within the guide itself. This, exp this included explaining our goals for the ONU Black Voices Project, including that we hope to sustain it as a resource that would continue to grow in the future, stating that we were providing digital copies of historic materials in the guide, and that due to the subject matter, some might contain offensive text and or images, and perhaps most importantly, the inclusion of a takedown request process. For us, it was important to include this process in the guide as we wanted to make sure to respect both the right to privacy and the intellectual rights of individuals that were would be highlighted through the work, especially due to the nature of the project. Oops. Um, now knowing that we were what we were trying to create, it was time to begin focusing on what we would include in the project. Based on our initial social media post, it was decided to begin by looking for Black voices featured in the Northern Review, which is our campus's student newspaper. We settled on this approach because based off of that initial collection survey that I mentioned, it was one of the very few identified parts of our holdings that contain perspectives from Black community members. It also happened to cover multiple generations of these community members. And many of the voices contained within the newspaper specifically spoke towards Black identity and Black history on ONU's campus, which was something that we were particularly wanting to document. For each featured article, op-ed, and letter to the editor that we included, we uploaded a scan of the newspaper piece, gave a brief overview of what it contained, and when possible included an image of the individual or individuals whose voice were being documented in the piece. As of the time of this presentation, we have continued to work on the Northern Review section of the guide, and we, are cur or we currently have pieces dating from 1955 through 1987, and they touch on topics such as racism at ONU, the civil rights movement, Black identity and culture, and the Black Student Union's work on our campus. Um, for about a year after launching, the Northern Review articles remained the only featured section of the ONU Black Voices Project. Then in 2020, we added a new section focused on a literary magazine titled Never Again Silence, which was originally published in 1971. The magazine was written by Lima High School students, a small but racially diverse town close to, a or close to Ada and ONU, 
with support from the ONU Student Polaris Literary Magazine Student Group. The Lima students were all part of an Afro-American literature course at their high school, and their poems and creative essays were featured as an additional magazine inserted into ONU's Spring Polaris Magazine. In their accompanying forward, the high school student editors noted that the greatest service you as readers can do is to read this magazine, never again silence, with an open mind and be willing to have your eyes opened. This was especially important for our predominantly white campus on the time, or at the time, uh, that often were not exposed to diverse viewpoints and perspectives like this. Of additional note, as part of including the magazine in our project, we reached out to Lima High School both to get their permission to include the work in our work or in our larger project, and to see if there was any interest in marking the 50th anniversary of the publication. In the initial conversations, we received positive feedback, but then as the emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic occurred, uh, the conversations understandably came to an end earlier than we hoped. This also unfortunately included not receiving an official agreement to include the publication uh, before their attention was diverted to more urgent priorities. Consequently, before adding the magazine to our project, we had a series of discussions with stakeholders on campus and based off the positive messages that we had received from Lima High School before um, they had to again focus on the global pandemic and how that was affecting um, their processes. And due to local campus interest in making sure that ONU students had access to the magazine for the upcoming academic year, we decided to move ahead with including Never Again Silence. But for now, it is currently locked down to university campus access only. Uh, though this is something we hope to revisit in the near future. By this time, we were starting to receive more positive feedback on campus for the project, and this in part led to an unexpected conversation with the head coach of the ONU football team. In talking to the coach, he explained that in the aftermath of the tragic murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and others, that his players were wanting to take a series of anti-racist actions during the upcoming school year. One of those efforts included what the team was calling listen and learn interviews, where the head coach would host interviews with former black ONU players and coaches associated with the team, where he would listen to them discuss their perspectives on being black in America. It was asked if the interviews could be included as a part of the Black Voices project that the archives was maintaining, to which we quickly agreed. To me, this was an especially important moment for our work as it represented the first community-driven effort to contribute to the resource, led to new materials being added to our holdings, and documented what was happening on our campus at an extremely important time in regards to discussions and actions around racial injustice in America. As of right now, these remain the main sections of our guide. And while I'm not sure about how the guide has been used fully by our community, I do think it's worth briefly touching on a few of the ways that our campus community has engaged with the work. To start with, the with the library's mission being focused on support of the university's <clears throat> academic mission, it has been rewarding to see that the guide has been used as a resource by a small number of courses and students on our campus. One prominent example of this that I was thankful for was being invited to provide instructional sessions specifically on the Black Voices Project and Black History at ONU for one of our history courses this past year. Outside of the classroom, some student groups have also engaged with the resource and a big thank you to the respective faculty advisors for this, including the current Polaris Magazine Student Board and the Black Student Union. The guide has also been included as a local history resource for some of the ongoing di diversity discussion groups that have taken place during the past year, including a somewhat shameless inclusion in our library employees diversity reading series. And finally, it is my understanding that the project will be prominently highlighted in an article on diversity at ONU for an upcoming issue of our alumni magazine. As for next steps, well, I'm really happy to say that we are still in the process of working to expand the project. 
one target that we want to keep returning to is the Northern Review, because as we mentioned, we left off in 1987, but it is our hope that we will continue to work through the newspapers through their entire weekly print run. Additionally, we have also recently agreed to receive a series of scrapbooks, primarily from the 1990s and early 2000s from the Black Student Union, and upon transfer are looking to digitize them for potential inclusion in the project. Of note, the scrapbook opportunity in particular came together through the active support of the Office of Multicultural Development, who really championed the project to the Black Student Union and other student groups. Additionally, the Director of Multicultural Development and myself were able to collaborate to receive a small grant from ORAB specifically for funding a paid student internship opportunity this fall, which will lead to work on the scrapbook digitization and other diversity projects related or diversity projects related to work for the archives. Another new project that I'm excited for is a self-interview project tentatively titled Your Story. This project is being led by a group of Black alumni and the Office of Multicultural Development in the hope of providing an opportunity for alumni to contribute their personal stories back to campus as a part of our upcoming sesquicentennial year activities. As of now, the plan for the project is to have individuals record their own or their stories on their own by following a series of prompts and then submitting them to the archives upon completion. Or if they prefer, we're also looking to organize story booths during some of our large alumni focused campus events this coming year, such as homecoming and alumni weekend, where uh, individuals would be able to receive assistance in the recording of their story. But perhaps the change that I am most excited for is our current efforts to pivot from the ONU Black Voices Project to the ONU Diverse Voices Project. We are currently in the midst of this transition. Um, so right now it's still the Black Voices Project that is live, but behind the scenes, uh, we're working on some changes so that we can relaunch this summer. Uh, some of these behind the scenes changes include working to modify our original Your Story project plans from being focused specifically on Black alumni, as was originally envisioned, to being focused on alumni of various diverse backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Additionally, we are working on an effort to begin lifting LGBT plus voices on our campus mm -hmm. through the creation of a new section of the guide mm -hmm. that will focus on the struggle to get a GLB student group recognized on our campus during the mid 1990s. This will likely be similar to our previous Northern Review work for the Black Voices Project, but we are also looking to include archived websites and local and national news coverage as well through articles and video clips. <clears throat> to wrap things up, I'd like to briefly touch base on some of the lessons that I have learned from working on this project during the past couple years. To begin with, when undertaking diversity related reparative work like this, it is important to create as inclusive of an environment and processes as possible. As a loan arranger, I am used to often working through projects that are fully my vision and executed on my timeline. So for me, it was extra important to make sure that I was deliberately making space and time for community members and other stakeholders to participate when and if desired. As part of this, it has also been important to make sure to acknowledge the emotional labor of community members who have chosen to participate in the project. Additionally, and at the risk of stating the obvious, this has meant more than just passively listening and giving requests for work. Instead, it meant making sure that others could contribute and lead as they desired and saw fit, which is what led to parts of our project like the Listen and Learn interviews and the Your Story contributions as well as the pivot to ONU Diverse Voices. This in turn allowed for a sense of ownership within our larger communities at ONU, which has been important for both the project and the archives, as it has led to increased exposure, raised archival awareness, increased donations of materials, and new ideas. Additionally, that sense of community ownership has led to some really important feedback on the project which has allowed us to revise and improve on the work that we are doing and for which I am eternally thankful for. 
Finally, I cannot recommend enough that if you're going to undertake reparative archival work like this, that you take the time to promote your, work, your and your community members' work to internal and external audiences. After all, this is a big undertaking, and so you'll want to take steps to make sure that the work reaches as wide of an audience as possible, while at the same time acknowledging those who have contributed their voices, labor, and expertise to help push the work forward. Thank you so much for your time, and I welcome any questions or feedback at the end of this session. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Well, uh, I guess I'm up. Uh, as Bill had said, my name is Vic Fleischer. I'm the University Archivist, Head of Archival Services at the University of Akron. Thanks, Matt, for that great presentation. And uh, I'm glad we're just ending our sesquicentennial. <laughs> uh, I hear that you'll be you'll be starting yours. So it was uh, a fun year. We uh, uh, accomplished a tremendous amount, uh, the staff and I, and uh, uh, but I'm glad that it's ending and we're moving on to, on to some new things. But uh, so let's see if I can get my slides up here. <clears throat> can everybody see, see that? Yes. Thank you. All right. <laughs> okay. So uh, similar to what uh, uh, Matt is doing at ONU, we uh, uh, recently just celebrated our sesquicentennial or 150th anniversary at the University of Akron. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about um, not only how we use this unique opportunity uh, to celebrate our history and showcase uh, underutilized collections at the university, but um, also how it offered us an excellent opportunity to examine our collections and see what was either missing or wasn't well represented uh, in the institutional archives and in the historical record. And, uh, you know, of course, not surprisingly, um, those were collections and materials that document um, underrepresented uh, or marginalized communities at the university and in the wider community of which the campus is a part. Uh, so I'll be talking a little bit about how we use this opportunity to try to rectify that by focusing our attention on um, promoting the current resources that we did have in the archives uh, documenting these groups and um, how we reached out and collaborated with numerous groups on campus and in the community to try to collect more voices, more of their important history to be as inclusive as possible to tell those missing parts of our university. We figured that 150 years uh, was definitely time and far overdue to um, uh, spend more time and attention focusing on on some of those voices and i think we've done a decent job in the past i've been here 14 years hard to believe came in 2007 and we had some collections that documented local african-american history and i think we've done a, a decent job uh over the last several years of, of promoting and digitizing those collections more and collections that document local women's history but of course when it comes to the university archives um, rather than our regional or local history collections, those materials seem to be a, a little lacking. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we, again, um, showcase, told some of those stories of materials that we have and how we reached out to, to gather uh, more stories. And of course, this includes um, um, mostly the African-American community or Black community, um, uh, LGBTQ+, plus women's history, and people with with disabilities as well. Um, so I'll also talk briefly about how the pandemic, uh, and especially the death of George Floyd, the Black Lives Matter movement, anti-Asian violence, renewed calls for social justice and racial, racial equality also affected uh, these projects. So um, yes, as our, I'll give a little background here in a minute, but yes, as our sesquicentennial was getting ready to kick off, we had all these things going on that we had to, had to contend with and, uh, you know, including the, worldwide pandemic and then, um, you know, the uh, 
uh, protests and, and renewed calls for social justice and racial equality. So uh, finally, at the end, I'll cover uh, lessons learned regarding collecting and amplifying diverse voices, especially during an anniversary celebration and how others uh, can hopefully adopt similar, similar projects. Um, so just give you a little bit of background about the university, the archives and our sesquicentennial. Don't want to spend too much time on this, but the University of Akron was founded as Bookville College in 1870 by the Ohio Universalist Convention. If anybody's familiar with the, the Universalist, Universalist, now the Universalist Unitarian Church, they combined back in the 60s, I believe. Uh, it was very liberal religion. So we accepted women and, and African Americans, um, you know, from, from the very start. And we were, even though founded by a religious domination, were non denominational. Um, and then we went through several transformative periods. Uh, um, throughout our history, let's see, uh, 1907, we became a private liberal arts college, 1913, a municipal university, and then finally a state university in 1967, when a lot of you were also becoming state universities. Uh, we currently have about 19,000 students. I thought it was a little lower than that, but that's the official number on the website. We're a metropolitan campus in Akron with more than 80 buildings and four regional campuses. We have numerous academic programs, many nationally ranked, renowned for most of our law engineering, and of course, our polymer science and polymer engineering program. And I say uh, numerous academic programs, because if any of you have uh, read the press uh, over the last uh, four or five years, uh, we have been having some financial difficulties. Um, uh, you know, former pr president retired, and, you know, he had to kind of overbuild to, to compete with uh, other universities and attract students. And, um, you know, let us left us with quite a bit of debt, uh, about $65 million in debt. And uh, so we've um, <laughs> uh, had a succession of, I think, about four presidents in about five years. <laughs> so it's been interesting times at the University of Akron. So we, we've uh, unfortunately had to right size, as they call it, and cut a number of academic programs and um, uh, support services. And we've recently, because of the, then the pandemic hit, and uh, there were layoffs and more layoffs, including some of our tenured faculty, believe it or not, that made the Chronicle of Higher Education. Um, so, um, you know, it's been an interesting time at the University of Akron, but uh, we are we are on the rise and we're actually uh, 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 in the position now where there's a little bit of a surplus and we're actually rehiring um, some some faculty and staff. So so things are looking up, but uh, just wanted to give you some background to put things into context. Um, so archival services is my department. Um, this consists of uh, the university archives, our special collections, or regional history collections, and our records management program. Founded as university archives in 1965, became archival services, and we're soon hopefully going to go through a name change uh, in 1972 when we started collecting materials on local history and became a part of the local government records program. Uh, so our mission is to collect, oops, there's a typo, <laughs> preserve and provide access to primary and secondary sources that document most of the history of the University of Akron and the region, uh, which for the most part is Akron and Summit County, um, particularly focusing on the history of the rubber and polymer in industry, which is so uh, intimately linked with the history of our, our university and our campus. We uh, taught the first course in rubber chemistry in 1908 at the university. Uh, we're about a 36,000 square foot facility, about 40,000 cubic feet of material, so it's quite a sizable collection. Uh, about 12,000 cubic feet of university archives materials, and we get about 4,500 inquiries per year. Uh, and I swear they've been increasing since the pandemic. <laughs> so uh, as people have uh, you know, been, been home and, and spending time uh, doing genealogy and doing research projects, I don't know if some of you have experienced that too, but we, um, not just the sesquicentennial, but I think because of the pandemic uh, experience an uptick in the number of research requests. So uh, it's been quite a busy year. A uh, little bit of background about our sesquicentennial. We've been planning it for several years um kind of much to my chagrin <laughs> i've been pushing them since our 140th anniversary to start planning for the 150th um as i had mentioned um you know we 
having some financial issues and that led to some negative PR and uh, decrease in enrollment, decrease in donations. So, um, and I just think, you know, we, we got the impression that um, some of our administrators just weren't going to be there <laughs> for the sesquicentennial and lo and behold, uh, like I said, we've gone through about uh, four presidents in about five years. So we have a great president now, uh, Dr. Gary Miller, who's really getting us on track and uh, um, it's kind of been a, a good stabilizing uh, force at the university. Um, so really it wasn't until about 2018 that uh, one of our interim presidents uh, who rose through the ranks has been at the university for, for 30 years uh, said, yeah, our sesquicentennial is coming up. Let's do something, let's plan for this. And uh, finally gave us a little bit of money. I think the archives itself got uh, $200,000 roughly to uh, hire two part-time staff members to work on sesquicentennial projects and uh, also funding for several digitization projects. Um, so that was unheard of. That's that's never happened uh, as long as I've been in this profession that uh, the, the administration just handed you a, a, a a bucket load of money. So um, we, we happily took it and made good use of it. Um, they appointed a, a main sesquicentennial committee and several working groups that consisted of faculty, staff, administrators, alums, and friends of the university. Um, so we were founded May 31st, 1870. So May 31st, 2020 was our kickoff for the sesquicentennial year. We celebrated for one full year, just ending um, this past May 31st. And we still have a couple projects we're trying to wrap up, but uh, like I said, uh, very happy it's over. <laughs> I'm ready for a vacation. And uh, I just got back from vacation last week. So uh, uh, anyway, um, a lot, lot of hard work, but we accomplished a lot. And a lot of what, you know, obviously I'm gonna be talking about here is documenting uh, and amplifying those those diverse voices. So there are a number of sesquicentennial projects at the university level, including a book, 150th website, campus banners and murals, as you see here, um, a six episode docu-series on UA history. Uh, we had a virtual gathering and toast uh, that was in lieu of our accessible centennial gala that was planned for 10, 10, 20. Not sure why they picked that date. Um, it doesn't have any significance in university history, but I guess the fall was a good time around homecoming to uh, to kick off and to celebrate. Uh, and we had a celebration of academic, academic excellence, which was previously referred to as the parade of colleges. But since we eliminated uh, three or four colleges or combined, I should say, three or four colleges, they changed the name to celebration of academic excellence, where each uh, college got to showcase their history and celebrate their heritage. Um, so things we were, uh, again, in archives um, involved with really the majority of projects on campus is they had a historical component, but the ones we were in charge of specifically um, were uh, social media posts on UA history, the book and 150th website, uh, an oral history project, online exhibits, digi digitization projects, and processing and preservation projects. And as, and as I had mentioned uh, as the, the topic here of the uh, of the talk, um, all projects really, we try to incorporate a component of diverse voices and focusing on um, the history of under, underrepresented or marginalized communities. Um, so it was important to the archives and the libraries to do that even before, but especially after um, the events of, of last spring and summer with the, the death of George Floyd, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, and the uh, anti-Asian violence that, that uh, we experience in this country. Um, so we really kicked off with a series of social media posts on uh, our university, in particular our university library's Facebook page. There's the link there, facebook.com slash Libraries. Uh, we did a series of posts, um, This Day in University History, diary entries from Bookdale College students, letters from Bookdale College students. Uh, we had a great series of letters that a, a donor had contacted us and will be donating these to us soon, a series of letters from um, two sisters that were early Bookdale College students and uh, uh, their, their kind of life on campus and the, the things that they dealt with. Um, on campus being being young ladies on campus. Um, we did posts for Women's History Month and Black History Month. And of course, as I had mentioned, um, the sesquicentennial kickoff really was supposed to happen May 31st, right around the time of um, 
unfortunately, you know, the, the uh, George Floyd's death and um, um, uh, the riots and the protests and, and uh, our university communications and marketing said this probably isn't really a good time to be celebrating our history and, and looking back to our past. Um, so the kickoff was was very subdued and what we tried to do was develop um, social media posts on on the recent calls for social justice and racial equality and tie that in with um, some of our collections on black history and past calls for social justice racial equality um, so that included um, as you see in the post here i was going to try to show the website but uh, i want to be aware of the time here um, uh, calls in um, the mid 1980s, uh, the uh, anti apartheid protests. Um, let's see, check my notes here. Um, um, the Bookdale Hall takeover in 1969, our administration building, Bookdale Hall, was uh, taken over by members of the Black United Students in 1969. Um, and um, um, one thing that you know uh, positive things that came out of that were the creation of our black studies program our black cultural center and um, hiring of more african-american staff and faculty on campus so so those are some of the posts that we we focused on i'll try to show that site here in a little bit but i don't want to get out of my <laughs> powerpoint and then not be able to get back in um so instead of focusing kind of on you know celebrating our history we look back at um again past um movements and calls for, for racial equality and social justice on campus and, and focused on um, collections from individuals uh, from the local African-American community, particularly those that had fought for civil rights in the past. And um, those were pretty well received. I think uh, we got 73 likes, 31 loves and 18 shares. Um, so I thought that that was pretty good. Um, as for our sesquicentennial book titled Hail We Akron, the Third 50 Years of the University of Akron, 1870 to 2020, uh, the title was taken from our alma mater. So if you're wondering where that comes from. Um, so as I'd mentioned, um, we weren't getting a lot of buy-in from the administration uh, about three years leading up to our sesquicentennial to really invest time and resources into this celebration. Um, so finally, in about 2018, when it, our interim president uh, Dr. Green said, yes, we should do something for this. Here's some money and here's a committee uh, go forth um, and you should do a book. And we said, we're not going to be able to get a, a, an updated history written in two years. Uh, that's not going to happen. So we had a uh, former dean, a retired dean, son of one of our former presidents, our longest ser serving president, Dr. Auburn, uh, that uh, really championed uh, this book. And you know, if it wasn't for him, I'd just say we, it probably wouldn't have materialized. Um, and it was his idea to crowdsource the book, to ask for um, submissions. So we, we developed a website, you actually edu slash hail uh, through B Press or what we call Idea Exchange, where people could submit their memories and their stories of campus, uh, be it positive or negative. And uh, we developed a committee, a uh, book committee, and we made sure that that committee from the start had um, uh, diverse voices, um, a diversity represented on that committee from African Americans to Asian Americans, uh, people with disabilities, um, LGBTQ community. And um, not all the stories were positive, but um, we did, I should say the university did, and uh, I commend them for that, uh, include a lot of those, of those voices, even some of the negative ones. And uh, I think we have a little bit of time here. I'm gonna try to read a couple of these. Uh, one is titled, A Call to Provide Greater Support to the LGBTQ Community on Campus. Um, the gentleman writes, I've seen the problems for LGBTQ plus students on our campus. I've helped LGBTQ plus students find housing after being kicked out by unsupportive family members. I have listened to the students as they dealt with bullying and harassment in our school and on the job. On a campus that doesn't provide enough support for students who are just dealing with the stresses of college life, our students who are also a part of a marginalized community have an ever, ever larger gap in the needs versus supportive structures provided. And, and kind of goes on and um, talks about, you know, how the university hasn't done a good job in the past and could do a better job in terms of, of supporting the LGBTQ um, 
community in particular. And, and there, uh, we had a number written by African Americans, some very positive and some um, not too complimentary of the university and how African Americans were, were treated in the past. So um, this actually led to some concerns by the administration, I hate to say, um, regarding an oral history project that we had then um, talked about doing that, that um, I had helped conceive. Um, so when I came to the University of Akron, uh, we, we had a wonderful uh, collection, robust collection of, of local history and university history, but we didn't have much of a robust collection of oral histories. So one thing I always wanted to do and I was to build an oral history collection and I thought that um, the sesquicentennial would give us an opportunity to do that, at least with university history. And then it was a way to involve our students in the sesquicentennial. Uh, so I collaborated with a local, uh, with one of our history professors and team taught an oral history class. And we looked at what was missing from the historical record. And again, decided to focus on inclusion and diversity, um, African-Americans, women, LGBTQ community, people with disabilities. And uh, we assembled a group and, and uh, interviewed former uh, and, and current students, faculty, staff, and administrators. There's a image of the group there. Um, so again, due to stories collected for the book, the administration had concerns uh, a little bit about the topic of, of the oral histories, particularly because of the situation that we had been in financially, um, um, you know, the issues with the loss of enrollment, loss of donations due to some unpopular decisions made by a past administration. Um, so they were um, a little, you know, I, I guess, I'll say overly concerned about any negative PR uh, that we we might receive. In fact, I'll share a story. One of my staff uh, did a social media post about parking on campus and we got tons of negative calls and, and feedback uh, regarding that, you know, but parking is a, a contested topic. Uh, parking's never been good on campus. Anyway, I got a call from our head of university communications and marketing that kind of read me the riot act. like. You know what are you trying to do to us <laughs> right right we're trying to avoid any negative publicity and uh, i even got a call from our dean's office just to just to take that post down so uh, we wanted to be very careful about um you know obviously um these stories need, need to be told and it's an important part of our history and we have to present um those stories as as people tell them but there was some concern and and um and many of the, the stories, uh, the oral histories and the stories in the book weren't positive. There's stories of racism, sexism, lack of facilities for people with disabilities. Uh, but again, we felt an obligation as historians and archivists to capture and to tell uh, these stories. So um, um, I wanna make sure we leave enough time for questions. So I might not show some of the videos unless we have time at the end. Um, however, I, I think, you know, with the <clears throat> Black Lives Matter uh, movement, the resurgence in that, the renewed calls for social justice, racial equality, um, really confirm the importance of these projects that we were doing and that they were even more crucial and timely. And uh, our new president is, is seems very progressive and, and supports a, um, environment in a campus of inclusion and diversity. In fact, he uh, reconstituted our diversity council. He started a community dialogue last summer that was online because of the pandemic to discuss race on campus and in the community. And uh, now recently launched our social justice task force. So um, because of all that, I, I think it, our projects, the book and the oral histories got a lot of uh, positive feedback and a lot of support from the campus and the community. And we've even received uh, a couple awards and some recognitions for that. Um, quickly, because I know we're uh, running a little bit out of, uh, behind here. Um, we also curated a number of exhibits on university history. Um, being that with the pandemic, uh, we couldn't do um, physical exhibits. Uh, so we decided to move those into the online environment. We used WordPress. Uh, for better or worse, that's that's what what, what we used. Um, it's it's a decent platform. Um, doesn't require support from IT, which was the big thing. Uh, but the one exhibit that we really focused on was uh, for Black History Month, and uh, the historical commemoration working group suggested that we do an exhibit on the Book the Hall takeover by the Black United Students in 1969. And I had some concerns about this due to the sensitive and controversial subject matter. Um, you know, the uh, building was taken over by gunpoint. Uh, there were numerous hostages that were held. 
uh, in the building for several hours. Fires were set in other buildings across campus. Um, there were extended lawsuits uh, after um, the event took place and, and some former students, you know, served, uh, served some jail time. So it's a very, uh, very sensitive um, topic to approach. So um, I was a little reluctant to take that on, to be quite honest with you, especially when uh, there were, you know, uh, especially sensitive to any negative publicity and, um, um, you know, and be quite honest with you, there have been, you know, a lot of layoffs. So um, we decided to do the exhibit anyway and to uh, um, be careful how we framed it. Uh, we put it in broader historical context and tied it in with current and past calls for social justice and racial equality on campus. And uh, it was titled Peace and Power, Black Activism at the University of Akron. Uh, I think I have a link here somewhere if you want to take a look at it. I'd like to show it, but we're running a little bit behind time. So um, we also focused on some other calls for uh, racial equality, the anti-apartheid protests in 86 and the protests on campus and the community uh, in the 90s after the Rodney King incident and the LA riots. And again, we tried to focus on the positive outcomes of um, you know, what uh, these protests uh, had led to, which like the creation of our Black Studies program, the Black Cultural Center, which is now our multicultural center, uh, the creation of our diversity council and the hiring of, of additional Black faculty and staff. Um, some other projects we did, uh, of course, uh, digitization projects and processing projects. And, and we, again, try to um, highlight and incorporate collections that document underrepresented communities. So we digitized um, oral histories from our Black Cultural Center. Um, we digitized the photos on the, on the Bookdell Hall takeover. Um, we digitized a lot of our women's history collections, including a collection of books on uh, Lucinda Anti Brown, who was um, uh, an early, um, kind of matron of the campus back in the Bookdale College days that really uh, helped and, and took care and looked after our early uh, student body on campus. And again, we processed a number of collections, including our Black Cultural Center records, uh, Sherla McLean collection. She was a local African-American educator and graduate of the university and processed some of our women's history collections as well. Um, so some lessons learned, some, some takeaways. Um, you know, when collecting and documenting diverse voices, uh, collaboration is key. Um, we collaborated with a number of departments on campus and throughout the community, um, including our sesquicentennial committees, which did include some diverse, um, diverse makeup, uh, community members, alumni, um, our multicultural center and office of diversity and inclusion, and uh, the McLean Gallery of Akron's Black History and Culture. And uh, we, uh, tried to seek feedback and input and, and get buy-in from, from these groups. And uh, so I guess the lessons are, you know, to, to take risks and chances, uh, don't be afraid of controversy. However, have a plan in case the administration, the board, in case you get yourself in some hot water and they're questioning what you're doing. Um, and, uh, but, you know, again, um, you know, as Matt had even said, it's, it's our job as we know, as, as archivists and historians to ensure that our collections are as diverse and inclusive as possible, that they document a broad representation of the diverse student body and communities that we, we serve and represent, and that we document all voices and try to fill those gaps or voids in our collections. And uh, I believe our anniversary uh, is an opportune time to, to do just that. So uh, I think we have about 10 minutes left and we can entertain questions uh, or have a brief discussion about these topics, maybe how some of you folks are um, trying to collect more of these voices and some projects you're doing. Uh, if there are any questions, I can try to show a few segments of the videos. But thank you. Thank you, Vic, for two very powerful presentations. Yes, please post your questions into the Q&A box and, or into the chat. Uh, I'm going to actually, while we're waiting for some questions, uh, Vic, I just have to ask you on holding down the, uh, the blog post, what was the reaction of the people that wrote the post when you your last thing said, don't be afraid of controversy, and yet you faced it uh, in, in, in library world where we're, you know, censorship and all? Yes, yes. So, um, you know, very few of the posts, particularly the ones on um, 
you know, the Black Lives Matter, renewed calls for racial justice, uh, um, um, uh, social equality. V- very few of those had any comments, you know, just had a lot of likes or loves or thanks for sharing this. I learned a lot about um, university history and this aspect of our history. Um, so not a lot of controversy there, but, uh, you know, as I'd mentioned, just the um, um, things like the, the, the one about parking just <laughs> seemed to be very controversial. And, uh, um, you know, so um, all, all of the comments were, were very positive about, um, you know, the, 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 the blog post that we did for, um, you know, Black History. So, which, which you would think that they would be, but, <laughs> you know, in the world we've been living in lately, uh, you know, uh, I guess nothing surprises me anymore. I agree. Thanks. Matt, you, you, there was a lot of, lot of wins, a lot of great things that were going on with what you, you know, you found funding, you got community support, you had outreach opportunities, uh, you, great suggestions. You were able to add to oral histories. But what were some of the things that, when I say uh, roadblocks, I mean, you're a lone arranger, that's, that, that, that's a handful right there. But what other things that, you know, not everything just, you know, not every outreach, not every community was, was welcoming, what, what, what other tips? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, there were definitely challenges associated with it and don't, definitely don't want to minimize those. Um, just with limited time, wanted to focus on the other things for the presentation itself. Um, I think the two biggest challenges were one, um, and referencing what you already said, being a lone arranger and balancing the work of trying to do this with other priorities as well. Um, it meant to do the work in a serious and informed way, especially with community engagement. Um, work often went a little bit slower than what I had hoped or envisioned. Um, but, you know, I think that was just important because we wanted to make sure we were putting out a pro- product project that people would be happy with um, for what it was trying to achieve and it could stand on its own. And like I said, we were clear from the beginning, we didn't want to work on a definitive timeline. Like to us, this is a, a project that should always be ongoing and can be updated to reflect the times. Um, and I think the other big challenge was when you hoped there would be opportunities or thought there might be opportunities. And then, and this was usually more with campus stakeholders that um, do not necessarily represent diversity themselves uh, in their offices. Um, When you start talking to them, all of a sudden there's less interest than what you originally thought. Um, I know a couple of times I engaged with offices on campus that we're really glad a work was taking place and really wanted, especially the upcoming sesquicentennial, really wanted to leverage that work for the celebration atmosphere of the upcoming year. And then um, in communicating to them that, you know, yes, the archives wants to support celebration, but also history is not necessarily celebration. They're two different things. And we wanted to take this really seriously as our historical archival work. Um, and then as we, you know, as they started diving more into some of the stories that were being highlighted through the work, um, the response we come, you know, I remember one response vividly in my mind for an office that was very excited to do something that then communicated back. Uh, we've thought about it more. And for now, you know, we think we won't go ahead <laughs> with a project after all, but we'll be back in touch with you if we change our minds. So those were some of the challenges. Excellent. We have some questions coming in. Uh, The first one, we are all in small shops. How were you able to reprioritize to push these projects to the forefront? What did you have to suspend? Did your administration back back up your decisions or did you constantly have to defend what you were doing? Uh, I'll take that first, I guess. Uh, I don't know. We just did it. Uh, one of the benefits of being at the university for a long time and, and having tenures, although, as I'd mentioned, as I found out, tenure doesn't always mean what we thought it meant. And, you know, with, uh, unfortunately, uh, layoffs of tenured faculty. So, um, um, but, uh, you know, I, like I said, I, I think there was a little bit of, not pushback, but concern that maybe this isn't going to 
some of these stories aren't going to paint us in a positive light and we're really trying to rebuild our reputation right now and you know it's picking with the community and uh build our donors back we had donors that were refusing to donate to the university and and people that were refusing to, to send their students to the university uh because of of issues that have been happening financially and 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 other things but um so again, yeah, we had to be very careful of that. But uh, like I said, with everything that, that's been going on, I, I think um, it's it's made it more important to focus on these topics. And uh, so, so I think we did get a lot of a lot of support uh, for this. And I, we just made it a priority that you know we're, we're documenting our history, we're telling our history here, 150 years, and and these stories are an important part of that history. And uh, again, just trying to promote what we had, and then collecting more of what we didn't have. I thought was was very important um, not only to fill those gaps, but uh, um, again to try to you know it's our job to educate our student body, so so to pe make people you know promote um, uh, you know tolerance and understanding of adverse groups. So um, and I hope that's what this does. Yeah, and just to add to that a little bit, um, I was pro privileged in the fact that. Um, when I interviewed for the job at Ohio Northern, um, I already had, or was in a job that I was very happy with and appreciated at another institution. And so during my interview, I was able to state quite honestly about my view on various archival issues, including uh, dismantling white supremacy in archives and work along that aspect. So um, when I came in, at least the people that were involved in my hiring process had an idea of some of the work I wanted to do. And um, so as a part of that, when I started focusing on this, I just talked to my director, uh, some of my colleagues and other campus stakeholders and said like, hey, I really want to work on this. I, you know, as I've talked about, I see an opportunity here. This is what I'd like to do. Um, and luckily mm -hmm. I did get full support from everyone I needed to at that time. Uh, as for the deprioritization of other projects then, um, I really, um, anything else that was related to um, directly to user interactions with the archives, I did not want to deprioritize. You know, want to keep working with everyone as quick, you know, as efficiently as you can. And so for me, that meant um, we had a pretty significant archival backlog here that I really want to get through. Um, and it's still there. Um, and initially, I had really an ambitious time rate for getting through that. But um, that has been the main thing I've decided to slow down for multiple reasons so that I can focus more on some of this diverse voice work that we've talked about. Excellent question. Thank you. We have another one in here. Matt, you spoke about emotional labor. Can you talk about how you had to revise as well as how you ensured and provided space for, com for community and staff to take time they needed for self-care. And Vic, how did you handle this as well? Sure, so I can start with that one. Um, and I should start by saying, um, this is something I was really trying to learn in the process and I'm still trying to learn. So um, please don't take anything I'm saying as authoritative or expert in any ways. It's just what I was trying to do through this particular project. A um, Couple of the main things that I did was again, um, I made, I wanted to stay ex extremely flexible on timelines and even if people wanted to participate or not, um, it might've actually gotten annoying from a uh, reader end, but in every communication that was like email that I would send out, you know, to stakeholders that were um, graciously giving of their time and perspectives to help with this, make sure to say every single time, like, you know, thank you for all that you've done. If you choose to wanna um, do something else, um, take as much time as you need, let me know if you have any questions, and really just try to give them as much space as possible. Um, I would also sometimes share pieces that for various reasons I was less sure about uh, possible inclusion in the project work that we were doing and explain to them uh, what was contained in what I was about to share with them and why I was potentially concerned about it but also saying that, you know, because of my perspective with the privilege that I have, I am, you know, not sure I'm the best lens to be analyzing it. 
So um, again, if you feel comfortable looking at this, let me know. And like, I really like always tried to do these things through email or conversations where people would be given time. Like um, when we did actual face-to-face -face meetings, I would never bring something up new that from my perspective might cause trauma or difficulty for community members that were involved with it. I, I just wanted to make sure I wouldn't spring anything on anyone. So hopefully that answers your question uh, somewhat and thank you for it. Okay, I see that we have gone over. Um, you have both Vic and Matt's con contact information. There was actually a comment in there. I, I hope you saw it, Vic, from a student at the University of Akron. Thank you for the, the work that the archives have done on this. It was very positive, so. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you again, and uh, Matt and Vic for a, a very impactful presentation, and we'll be back here in an hour for the lightning round poster sessions. Thank you again. Enjoy lunch, everyone. Thank Thanks you, everyone. Lunch, everybody.